This problem is about simple harmonic motion. Pause the recording and take a few moments to read through the question carefully. So what we have in this problem are two clocks. Draw one over here and I'll draw the other over here. The first is a grandfather clock. So please excuse my lack of artistry. But that is my very rough impression of a grandfather clock. And we know that the diameter of the ball at the bottom is five centimetres. Well, on the modern clock, instead of a ball and string, we have a thin rod instead. And both of these are swinging. And what we're going to work out is how long does the string on the grandfather clock have to be? We'll call that L1. And how long does this rod have to be? We'll call that L2. Uh, so that both clocks tick exactly every second as a clock should. The first thing to consider in any pendulum problem is can we treat the pendulum as a simple pendulum or do we have to treat it as a physical pendulum, which is a little more complicated. A simple pendulum has a point mass suspended from a massless string. And obviously no physical system can have a mass with no size hanging from a wire with no mass. But what we need to ask is can we approximate this case as a simple pendulum? And in this problem, we're told that the diameter of the ball is five centimetres and it's suspended from a light and extensible wire. So what this tells us is that although this wire isn't massless, the fact that it's light means that we can approximate it as massless. And we have to think about, is the ball a point mass? Well, it has a diameter of five centimetres, so it's technically not a point mass, but we can approximate it as a point mass if the diameter of the ball is much, much smaller than the length of the wire. And in this case, if you have a grandfather clock, generally grandfather clocks are pretty tall. So we can approximate this as a simple pendulum. On the other hand, when we consider our funky modern clock, this has a rod instead of a ball and wire. So the rod can't be considered as massless and it can't be considered as having all of its mass at a point at the end. So in this case, we can't approximate this system as a simple pendulum. We have to consider it as a physical pendulum. So let's think about if there's anything else we know uh, about these clocks. And we're told that we want to work out how long it to be if it is to tick every second exactly. And it ticks when the pendulum reaches its maximum displacement. So it'll tick over here, and it'll tick again when the ball is over here, or likewise when the rod is at its maximum displacement on each side. So if we want that to tick every second, then we know that for each clock, the period of the oscillation will be two seconds, because the period is the time for one complete oscillation. So for the ball to start, swing over there and swing back, that is the period of the oscillation. So in both of these cases, for both clocks, the period of the oscillation will be two seconds. So then we have to think about how the period of the pendulum relates to the length of the pendulum. And the period of the oscillation is the inverse of the frequency of the oscillation, which is given by 2 pi over omega, where omega is the angular frequency. Now, for a simple pendulum, there's a known relationship between the angular frequency omega and the length of the pendulum, which is omega equals the square root of gravitational acceleration over the length. So what we can do is equate our two expressions for omega. So omega can be written as 2 pi over the period t, or it can be written as the square root of g over l. So now what we can do is rearrange this expression to make l the subject of the equation. So squaring both sides gives us 4 pi squared over t squared equals g over l. So our length l can be written as g times t squared over 4 pi squared. And what we can do then is put in our numbers. 
So G is 9.8. Our period was 2 seconds, so that's times 4, which gives us the answer for L as 0 0.993 metres. So there's one last thing we have to be careful of here. This is the length of the pendulum. And where that's measured from is from the centre of mass of the ball. So it needs to be in the centre of the ball. And our ball had a diameter, it had a physical size to it. So the ball's diameter was five centimetres. So the centre of mass of the ball, assuming it's uh, uniform and has a uniform density the whole way through, um, then the centre of the mass will be in the middle. So it will be 2.5 centimetres from the top. So our length of a pendulum is measured from there. So the length of our string, L1, will be given by L minus 2.5 centimetres, which is 99.3 minus 2.5, which is 96 0.8 centimetres. Now there are two things to think about. The first is always at the end of a calculation, do a kind of order of magnitude check. Does that seem like a sensible answer? And again, I would say thinking about the grandfather clocks that I have seen, 96 centimetres for the length of the string sounds pretty sensible. The second thing is if you remember back to the start of the question, we made an assumption. We made an assumption that the size of the ball was much smaller than the length of the string. And so we need to see if that was a fair assumption, or do we need to go back and consider this differently? And again, I would say that if the ball has got a five centimetre diameter and the length of the string is approximately a metre, we're looking at 5% of the total length is the ball. So again, I would say that that does count as the ball being much, much smaller than the string. So our assumption holds and we can treat this as a simple pendulum. So now let's have a look at our physical pendulum, our modern clock, and consider that. So, as before, the period of the oscillation is 1 over the frequency, which is 2 pi over the angular frequency, omega. And this time, for a physical pendulum, we have a slightly different relationship between the angular frequency, omega, and the length. And it is given by the angular frequency is the square root of the mass times gravitational acceleration times the length of the object divided by a quantity called I, which is the rotational inertia of the object. And I just want to make um, a point here that this length is the length from the pivot to the center of mass of the system. So in that case, this L will be that length there, because the center of mass of the uniform rod will be halfway along the rod. So that L will be equal to the length of the rod divided by 2. So now let's talk about this rotational inertia a little more. This depends really on three things. So rotational inertia depends on the mass of the object. It depends on the distribution of mass of the object. So what shape it is, uh, does it have a uniform density? And it also depends where in the object you're putting your pivot point. So for a long, thin, uniform rod, I'm not actually going to derive this, but if you want some more information, have a look in your textbook. But for a long, thin rod, the moment of inertia is a third times the mass of the rod times the length of the rod squared. And our length, we had designated L2. So now we can substitute that into our expression for omega. So omega can be rewritten as the square root of mg, we've got L2 over 2 as the length there, from the pivot to the centre of mass. And on the bottom we have our rotational inertia i, which was a third m times L2 squared. So straight away you can see that actually the mass of the rod cancels out. So it doesn't actually matter what the mass of the rod is, if it's at this length L2, it will oscillate with the angular frequency omega. So you could make it out of a different material, uh, whether you had it lead or aluminium, it would still tick at the same rate if it's the same length. But let's continue with rearranging that. So that gives us that omega is 3 times g 
over 2 times our length L2. So doing what we did before, we could equate our expressions for omega. So omega could be written as 2 pi over the period t, or it can be written as 3g over 2L2. So let's do a bit of rearranging of that. So first thing first, square both sides. So 4 pi squared over t squared equals 3g over 2 times L2. And again, we want to make L2 the subject of the equation. That's what we're trying to find out. So it gives us 3 times g times the period squared divided by 8 times pi squared. Remembering that t equal 2 gives us 3 times 9.8 times 4 over 8 times pi squared. And if we type that into a calculator, that gives us the answer of 1.49 metres. So basically one and a half metres. So again, have a think, does that seem sensible? Now I must admit, I've never owned a weird modern clock like this, but it's, it's physically sensible, it's physically possible. It's not hundreds of metres, it's not um, only millimetres. So it makes sense. And what we can also do is compare these two values. So for our modern clock, the length was one and a half metres. For our kind of traditional grandfather clock going back, the length of the string was a little under one metre. So by having this different situation where you have a rod rather than a ball at the end of the string, because the mass is distributed along the rod, rather than all being concentrated at the end as it is in the simple pendulum, we actually need to make the rod a lot longer to, to compensate for that. And then the only question for you is, which of these would you rather have in your house? And I think I would probably go for the grandfather clock, but that's off the point, so we'll leave it there.